Welcome to the Peep Show Podcast. Your glance at sex, society, and culture. With Jesse and PJ Singh. This is our first episode, so we'd like to take a minute to explain what we're all about. This podcast will showcase sex workers, artists, writers, academics, and activists talking about issues of sex and social justice. Each podcast will include conversations about recent news stories and a couple of short-form interviews with guests. Since this is our first episode, we only kind of know what we're doing, so try not to judge us too harshly, and we will try not to blow out your eardrums. Also, we promise to try to get a little bit better every time. Okay, let's get to it. To start the podcast today, we've each chosen an article to highlight. And the one that I have chosen was published yesterday in The Guardian by writer Alistair Gee. The title of the article is Facing Poverty, Academics Turn to Sex Work and Sleeping in Cars. So I have a couple of thoughts about this article. What he's trying to do is highlight the crisis actually in adjunct labor, so part-time professors, um, and why they're having such a hard time making ends meet. And this is a really serious crisis, I can say, and as a former academic and adjunct professor that I couldn't make ends meet as an adjunct, so I stopped doing that. So, uh, Me too, in fact. <laughs> yeah, but both of us actually have turned down ad- adjunct jobs because we can't afford it. So I am really always happy when there are articles published about the adjunct crisis. However, he puts side by side a sex worker and a couple of people who are homeless and living in cars. The sex worker that he talks to is very clear to say that this is a choice that she's made and she says quote this is something that i chose to do and adds later i don't want to come across as oh i had no other choice this is how hard my life is so she's actually super clear that she didn't make this choice out of destitution that she's doing it for reasons that are her own because she needs a job because she needs a job and it's a legitimate job and she even says I didn't want to do a six hour shift at a bar after each day of teaching. So she talks about the reasons why sex work is a better option for her than bartending or working at Starbucks or doing any other sort of part time labor in order to support her teaching career, which she talks about loving. I mean, to the credit of the author, he does put that in. However, the way that the entire article is framed reinforces and reifies this idea that sex work can only be understood in terms of destitution and survival and trafficking narratives. So one of the things that we want to do on this podcast is to highlight the voices of those who have chosen sex work in order to counter the dominant media narratives that sex work is the product of trafficking or of desperation. And I think that this article is actually a really good example of why this is necessary. Yeah, and it seems to me like that's clearly a sensationalist move on the part of the, I don't know if it was the editors or the author himself that chose this headline, but I think really, I agree, they seem to be bowing to these dominant narratives about trafficking, but doing so in a way that they're actually trying to capitalize off the sensationalism Mm -hmm. of uh, bowing to those narratives. And to me, that's what's really problematic. And I would argue that by doing that and by like so clearly and blatantly disregarding what the sex worker he interviewed actually said uh, there's a way in which he is you know very much complicit or you know actively engaging and exploiting that sex worker which right. of course ironically is the very thing that he's <laughs> yeah exactly. critique you know ostensibly critiquing right right and so it's yeah, when people say that nobody should engage in sex work or people shouldn't engage in sex work because it's exploitative, which is something that is said like over and over and over again, they're not actually taking into consideration the way in which they're exploiting the work of like sex workers for their own like gain. Right, yeah. And in this case, to sell newspapers or to... Clip. You know, clicks or whatever. Ad clicks or, you know, whatever <laughs> uh, journalists sell in 2017. <laughs> uh, but I think the gist of what we're both feeling after reading this is that it, it's hypocritical. Mm-hmm. Uh, it strikes me as a bit hypocritical. And I think it's a shame because, like you said, I think he's coming from a good place here. Uh, this is an important issue. There are really a lot of adjuncts 
Yeah, the adjunct issue is an important issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Uh, uh, who are living in poverty. There's a lot of efforts to unionize adjuncts because the working conditions are so terrible. And I think that's a really important thing to focus on. I just don't think we should be focusing on it in a way that exploits or disregards or somehow uh, demeans sex workers and their agency. Yeah. So my article is by Susanna Weiss, and it was in Bustle a couple weeks ago. The title is Belisa, a free porn site for women is changing how we view sex. And it describes the launch of a new feminist news, erotic literature, and porn site. Basically, it's an interview with uh, Belisa founder Michelle Schneidman. So the article asks, what would porn look like if it were built from the ground up by and for women? Schneidman responds, What we found is that women are interested in the true nature of sex. We want the storylines to reflect reality. We want the performer's pleasure to be authentic and the bodies relatable. In general, we want sex to feel real. There are elements of fantasy, to be sure, but mixed with realism. We call this, quote, fantasy fuel, and it's what really powers Beliza. Ironically, none of the porn on Beliza was actually built from the ground up. Instead, it was curated from tube sites, where, more often than not, it was stolen from the original curators, many of whom are independent porn producers. And moreover, the article celebrates Belize's lack of, quote, pesky paywalls, which, of course, is how performers and producers get paid. So pretty much the moment the article was launched, it provoked this enormous outcry from sex workers on Twitter, who were arguing that stealing from the women who create porn is in no way a feminist act. Prominent performers like Jizz Lee called upon models and their supporters to report all stolen content that Belisa had linked to, which caused it to disappear from the site. And this went on for several days before finally Belisa pulled down their porn section and issued an apology, and also Bustle updated their article. In the apology, Schneidman committed to only feature content in partnership with studios and where the performers had been paid fairly. So in my opinion, the best thing they could do is commit some of the reported $400,000 they have in startup capital uh, to hiring performers as consultants. And also they could create grants or contests to fund the production of the kind of porn they want to promote rather than just linking to it. So what do you think? Um, yeah, I actually have been thinking about this a lot. Um, obviously, people, everyone that works in camming and works in clip production and works in porn production is upset about this because we're all upset about stolen content and what happens on tube sites. But I think it's a little bit more complicated than that because what they were trying to do is create like a platform that women could relate to. And I think that the project by itself is a fairly noble thing. I also think that... The, the execution of it was poor because I don't think that they took into consideration what went into the production of all of these clips and how it is that performers get paid. And that seems like an enormous oversight. Which wouldn't have happened if they had bothered <laughs> to involve anybody in the industry in the process of creating a site for the industry. Yeah, but the thing that struck me that I was thinking a lot about is the shame that surrounds pornography. So one Mm -hmm. of the reasons that women don't know how to go about finding things that appeal to them is because they aren't taught anything about pornography. They're not like, things aren't, they don't feel that things are made for them. And so what Belize was doing was trying to create something that was made for them. Um, But it strikes me that that shame is not just about like women and how women access it, but it's also, it also impacts the reasons why performers aren't getting paid. So if there's a lot of shame around something, they viewers are more likely to go on to those quick tube sites to watch what it is that they want to watch, uh, to not connect their viewing with <laughs> their purchasing history in any way, and that it's a larger, more systemic problem, and that if we are to do what I think Belize wants to do, which is work to destigmatize pornography for everybody, then I think that it would be more advantageous for performers as well. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. I just think the idea that you're going to create a world in which better pornography exists without first committing to pay for the production of that better pornography is... um, Oh, sure. Enormously problematic. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's just a fantasy. It's not going to happen. And to the degree it does happen, it's going to happen on the backs of uh, sex workers who are being exploited. 
Right, right. No, I agree with all of that. And I understand the outrage about what happened here. And I think everybody should feel outraged about it. I just think that we need to have a larger conversation about about destigmatizing porn viewing as well, which I think is one of the things that they were probably trying to do, but what which got done very poorly in the execution. And, and particularly porn viewing for women, right? For women, yeah. But yeah. for everyone, I think. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And and I think uh, for that reason, and because Beliza was so quick to respond and uh, does seem to really want to engage and learn from their mistakes, I think it is worth trying to work with them. I just hope that what they learn isn't simply that they have to build their site differently, but that if they want to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish, then they need to bring people from the industry on board, particularly performers. Well, yeah, I think that that's probably the most interesting thing about it is if they just talk to one person, that it, is that it like it points to this very like strict dichotomy that people seem to have in their head between like viewers and performers, because if they were to ask like any performer, a performer would tell them that they shouldn't do it that way, that they should have set it up in a completely different way. So, yeah, I think that performers need to get integrated into uh, the design process. The design process, yeah. yeah. All right, well, I guess we'll wrap this up for now. Uh, promise that in the future, not all of our news segments will be exclusively about sex work, but... Uh, but there was big news stories this week. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, so we had to go where the news is. <laughs> have with us today Christina Marusic. She's a Pittsburgh-based freelance journalist who writes about LGBT equality, feminism, social and environmental justice, and politics. Her work has appeared in outlets like the Washington Post, Slate, Vice, Women's Health, Fusion, MTV News, and The Advocate, among others. She is also currently working on a memoir. You can find her work at ChristinaMarusic.com. So we invited her on today because last week was Bisexual Awareness Week and the 23rd was Bisexual Awareness Day. And Christina's written a lot on bisexuality, so we would like to talk about that today. How would you define bisexual? Sure, that's a great question. So I was a person who for a long time hated the word bisexual and wanted nothing to do with the label. Even when I thought it was a term that described me, I preferred to identify as queer. And a big part of the reason for that is that I was often dating transgender people, and I didn't want to use a term that I thought reinforced the idea that gender is binary. Right. Um, oh, so it felt exclusionary. It felt point. exclusionary, correct. And so it wasn't until someone took the time to educate me a bit, and then I did some additional reading, that I learned that, you know, the term bisexual is an umbrella term that includes mm-hmm. basically anyone who's not 100% straight and not 100% gay. And the term bisexual doesn't mean you like both men and women on a binary, but it means you like both members of your own and other genders. So it's actually, as it's used now, as I use it, a very inclusive term. And under that umbrella, you know, there's room for pansexuals and folks who identify as queer and... Right. I do think that the label is important and that embracing it is important because it's very difficult for to advocate for our community if we're unable to talk about ourselves as a community and with sort of concise terms. Um, yeah. I think it's important that people use labels they feel comfortable with and that fit and that people choose their own labels, absolutely. Right. Um, but I think in terms of public policy and research and grants, it's it's very important that we have some sort of label that we can use to talk about ourselves as a group. Yeah, I'm actually glad that you brought up um, public policy and grants, because I know you did some writing on medical research and research in general on bisexual people. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. So it's been known for probably a decade that bisexual people tend to fare worse in terms of both their physical and mental health than both their queer and straight counterparts. So bisexuals fare worse than gay people and lesbians and straight people when it comes to mental health and physical health too, and significantly worse. And so the research that came out this year, some of it 
suggested that a few of the reasons for that is that bisexuals face double discrimination. So in addition to facing um, discrimination for being queer out in the straight world, <laughs> right. um, we also often face discrimination within the LGBT community. Bisexual people make up over half, about 54% of the LGBT community. The B is prominent in the acronym. Right. Um, but... Despite that, you know, there's still a lot of stigma surrounding bisexuality, um, and bisexuals often have a tough time within the LGBT community. So, um, you know, that kind of stigma can lead to increased anxiety and feelings of not fitting in anywhere because you're not straight and you feel like, you know, it can lead to feelings of being not queer enough. And that stuff obviously takes a toll on people's mental health, but it also ultimately takes a toll on people's physical health. Um, You know, bisexuals have higher incidences of heart disease and cancer. That's Um, remarkable. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons. That's another reason why I think, you know, the label is important as a tool. I'll reiterate that I'm not interested in labeling anyone bisexual who doesn't want to be labeled (laughs) bisexual, Um, but that I think it's important that we be able to advocate for ourselves as a community. Another study came out recently that something like, I think it's a third of transgender Americans identify as bisexual. Yeah. Um, Yeah, that's really interesting. We can verify that one later, right? But so, um, you know, it's an identity that um, encompasses multiple letters in the acronym. Right. (laughs) Right. So again, healthcare initiatives that are specific to bisexual people are important and something we we should be talking about and thinking about and funding if we want things to get better. Yeah. So it sounds to me like you have what a lot of people might view as like a very loose umbrella for bisexuality and that like the way you're defining it a person could be like well I'm bisexual but I do it this way or I do it that way or here's how I express my bisexuality and so it sounds like for you this is very the way that you're trying to frame this term or encouraging us to think about this term is in the loosest possible sense because that would then serve as the basis for um, some sort of solidarity or collective action. Does that sound fair? Yeah, absolutely. And I saw a great uh, illustration on Tumblr that was like a very cute bisexual flag colored umbrella with a smiley face with all the labels underneath of it that fit under the bi umbrella. (laughs) And there are lots and lots and lots. um, And some people identify as homo romantic right. bisexual but homo romantic where they identify as bisexual but they only fall in love with people who have the same gender as them right. um, they mm-hmm. may sleep with people from other genders or they may you know have physical attraction physical or... attraction right but they don't fall in love or have long term relationships with those sure. folks right. so again yeah that's absolutely correct I'm using it in the broadest possible sense anyone who doesn't yeah. identify as either totally gay or totally <laughs> straight right yeah, I actually think that it's very useful to talk about bisexual bisexuality in that way because it seems that a lot of people are much more um, stuck with bisexuals are attracted to cis men and cis women, or at least that's the way in which they people conceptualize bisexuality. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you're not framing this as a kind of Kinsey sale sort of thing where it's just a simple continuum and, you know, bisexuality is everybody who is in a one or a ten, but that within that framework that there are lots of different ways in which um, bisexuality can be expressed. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> this maybe get, get me into hot water, so I'm going to choose my words carefully. Um, but I was someone who had a lot of internalized biphobia, and a mm-hmm. lot of my resistance to the label was because I was dating people who weren't necessarily on one or the other end of a gender binary that I didn't believe was real (laughs) or should exist. Um, But also because I just didn't like the word. I just had bad connotations with it. I had bad feelings about it. I I had all of the stereotypes and stigmas. I felt like you know, bisexuals were indecisive, or they were greedy, or they probably like, greedy weren't is capable a word of monogamy. That often gets like attached with yeah. uh, bisexuality. Want everyone, <laughs> and so I avoided that label like crazy. And I still identify as queer. I love how inclusive queer is, and Particularly there's because also queer can be about sexual orientation, but it can also be about gender, gender presentation, yeah. and and then also you know, there's that expression like not gay isn't happy but queer isn't fuck you like there's part of queerness that feels more aligned with 
Um, like political resistance. Political resistance, exactly. Sure. Yeah. Um, and so I love that term, uh, and I, I still use it. But I do think that part of the reason there are so many other terms is because a lot of people have an aversion to the term bisexual. Right. Um, it has had a bad rap for a very long time. And so I admire the queer community for coming up with all of these other <laughs> exciting options and for choosing labels that, that feel right and not feeling like they have to pick something that doesn't. But then also, I hope that we can change people's perceptions about what bisexuality is and what that label means. It's actually really interesting to hear you talk about that because I almost had the opposite sort of experience where I felt like bi made sense to me, but that I wasn't supposed to use that word, probably because of some sort of like internalized biphobia as well. So trying actually to use the term queer because that seemed more like politically advantageous to use. And I have no issue with the word queer (laughs) or with identifying as queer. And I I like the way in which like you've conceptualized queer here, but always kind of feeling like bi made sense to me, but I didn't want to say it for whatever reason, particularly in queer circles that because I I think that in queer circles, there's a lot of hostility still toward bisexuality. Yeah. When I was a baby, a baby bi. (laughs) (laughs) A baby bye. Christina as the baby bye. <laughs> in San Francisco, trying living in San Francisco, trying to right. figure it all out. I was like voraciously learning about LGBT history. Mm-hmm. And San Francisco is a great city to do that sure, in. Sure, um, yeah. But I couldn't help but notice, I was very aware of the fact that bisexuals seem to be missing from that narrative. And I later learned that a lot of the early LGBT rights activists who you know, have gone down in history for their contributions are in fact bi. But their bisexuality has often historically not been acknowledged, especially because of fears early in the movement that it would confuse people or that it wasn't, it was too complicated, you know, that they needed the narrative to be straightforward. So some people actually voluntarily hid their bisexuality in order to not rock the boat, to be better advocates, to feel like they were better advocates. But bisexual people have um, a long history of sort of leading the charge for LGBT equality and have made tremendous contributions to the community, which felt like an epiphany when I learned it. Yeah, right. Yeah, because if that's not spoken about, it's really difficult as a bisexual person to think that there's even any place within the history. Right. And it, it contributes to making us feel like we're not a part of the community. Right, right. Let's talk specifically about bi erasure. Uh, That's a thing that you've written quite a bit about. So maybe can you tell us what that is? Sure. Bisexual people are the only bisexual people and people under the bi umbrella (laughs) are are the only um, sexual orientation that can't rely on the apparent gender of their partners, the romantic partners to out them, right? right? If you identify as a lesbian and you present as a woman and you're dating someone who presents as a woman, people can gather that you are a lesbian. Right. If you identify as a straight person, same thing. If you identify as bisexual, unless you are part of a committed thruple that's really into PDA, <laughs> you don't have that same advantage. You right. have to out yourself anytime you want to be out, no matter who you're dating. Um, Particularly in very long-term relationships. Right, exactly. Yeah. I can still think of this time, it really makes me cringe, where Larry King, a few years ago when Anna Paquin was on, asked her about identifying as bi- bisexual. And she said, yeah. And he said, but you married a man. She said, yeah. And he said, so you're not a practicing bisexual. <laughs> <laughs> and that sums up by erasure. You know, she said, no, it doesn't work like that. She And she got a little flustered. And to her credit, she then handled it very well, considering, you know, she probably wasn't prepared to go on Larry King and have her have to, like, be a representative of the bi community <laughs> and combat by erasure. But, you know, she said, like, if you were dating a woman who then died and you weren't dating anyone else after that, would you no longer be straight? Like your That's your sexual orientation doesn't go. What if you go through away. a period of time in which you're not dating anyone or you're celibate? Right. Does that mean that the you know orientation that you have is suddenly Disappears. You, you're celibate? That's your orientation, right? So a big part of it is that just that visual cue. 
there's this idea that bisexuals have it easy because they can pass as straight sure if they want if they're yeah, in exactly. a straight looking relationship right um you know now we know based on all the research that actually you know we face double discrimination and it's right. a lot more difficult for us in a, a lot of situations that's and another having thing your identity erased uh um, right is actually fairly stressful <laughs> and and it comes up in healthcare that a lot of times healthcare providers don't actually know how to have those conversations after I'd been seeing my doctor for several years, it felt weird to suddenly be like, also, I'm bisexual. Um, right. But, but that's important for them to know that they have bisexual patients and yeah. also that we have a unique set of needs. Yeah. So one of the things that struck me really profoundly recently when I was thinking about the way in which like popular culture conceptualizes bisexuality is that it's very different along like gender lines too. So I was struck pretty strongly with the fact that for bisexual women, particularly femme presenting cis bisexual women, it's often thought that they are are experimenting in the way that we were talking about earlier and will end up with men. <laughs> and the exact opposite is a uh, thought about men who identify as bisexual, cis men who identify as bisexual. So what do you uh, make of that? So I was interviewing the author of the co-author of the book, Bisexual Health, Amy Andre, for Bisexual Health Awareness Month earlier this year. And she said something about this that totally blew my mind, which is that all ultimately boils down to the patriarchy, that when women are told like, oh, you're just going to ultimately end up with a man, you're really straight. And by men are told, oh, you're just going to ultimately end up with a (laughs) man, man, you're really gay. gay. It's so apparent that that is a symptom of our culture just valuing men more, right? Like assuming men are ultimately more desirable and that um, a man is going to provide more stability and more sexual appeal or whatever. Yeah, which is actually very interesting. But it also makes me think that part of that is not taking women's sexuality seriously. (laughs) Right. One cannot imagine that you would end up with a woman. A woman. Right. And I think that that's really interesting, particularly given the way that women are actually like sexualized in our culture, but they're sexualized in our culture, but simultaneously not taken seriously as like long term romantic or sexual partners. Right. Or as as sexual beings outside of their capacity to be appealing to straight men. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly right. right. Like, you couldn't right. possibly have sexual desires that don't revolve around me. So right. I don't believe that. Right. <laughs> what it comes down to. It seems to, that seems to be the case in terms of, like, women's romantic and sexual relationships with each other as well, that there's something that's almost viewed from the perspective of, like, straight men as mm-hmm. entertainment for them. Right. Which is ultimately part of the hope or desire that women will always eventually come back around, right? To, yeah. To heterosexuality. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so we talked about how women who come out as bisexual aren't taken seriously. Um, but we didn't really talk about um, the flip side, which is how men or cis men in particular who come out as bisexual, what the difficulties are for them. And it strikes me that the problem that they, that men experience isn't so much that they're not taken seriously. I think they're taken deadly seriously, but the problem is, is that their bisexuality, just like gayness is seen as an affront to their masculinity. Yeah. And that comes with all sorts of problems for uh, bisexual men. Which I think is a really good point because that's very different than what Christina and I were talking about. Where like with bisexual women, you're like, oh, that's very cute. And then it gets like brushed under the rug. Whereas with bisexual men, it's seen as threatening or in some way or as something that completely overtakes any other sort of uh, identity. Right. Well, and I do think... So for women, um, a lot of times amongst other queer women and lesbians in particular, Mm -hmm. um, I've definitely encountered lesbians who don't want to date bi women. Sure. um, And that's often because they feel that they will eventually want to date a man, right? Which is that same thing of like our cultural assumption that (laughs) dating men is just better. Right. Um, uh, So if you wanted to, why wouldn't? you right, right? yeah, or, yeah exactly. um, if you were interested why wouldn't you but but with 
men, a lot of times what they get from the gay community is like, oh, that's like a stepping stone to gay, right? Yeah. Like that's yeah. just... Um, and I think you're absolutely right that in this sort of macho, paternalistic... Mm-hmm world of the patriarchy <laughs> that we still very much live in, um, if you're bisexual, you're, um, like, less of a man, right? In the same way that if you're gay, you're less of a man. Oh, I was just thinking that it's worth mentioning coming out is hard, it's exhausting, bisexuals have to do it all the time. If you do it, you should feel really proud, and you should get a lot of credit, because yeah. you take a lot of crap that is often not acknowledged. So... I I don't want, um, you know, as we talk about erasure, I think one thing I don't want to do is make anyone feel bad or guilty if they don't feel safe or they don't feel comfortable or and they don't come out. Um, I think that's a really important thing to say. Yeah. So while while I think it's, you know, the more visibility we have, the better and that we we certainly have to fight for it to get it. It's okay. Yeah. (laughs) It's okay if you just can't. It's okay if you just can't sometimes. Or if you don't want to deal with that in all of your interactions all of the time. Yeah. I think it's important just to know that, you know, things are getting better and we got this. (laughs) And it's awesome to be bisexual. Yeah. Well, thank you for... uh, I will end on that happy note of awesomeness. That happy note note of awesomeness. (laughs) Thank you for the work you're doing and uh, for coming and chatting with us today. Really enjoyed it. Do you want to uh, plug anything? Um, You can find my writing at my website, christinamarusic.com. I'm on Twitter as ChristinaSaurusR. Great. Uh, That's a good good (laughs) handle there. (laughs) All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. On Tuesday, two sex cam models, Maggie Nichols and Jenny Jinks, did a show together on My Free Cams that was themed around the recent controversy over NFL players kneeling during the national anthem to protest police violence against black people. Based on the screenshots we've seen, the idea was that tips counted as votes for either, quote, take a knee or, quote, respect the flag, and that they'd perform either option during a playing of the anthem after a timer ran down. This became a major topic of conversation in the camp community when they decided to put on blackface. We don't know what their motivations for doing this was, but many people were outraged. And, as far as we understand, a My Free Cams admin told them to stop. They complied, but a witness tweeted that one of the cam models said, We have been healed from our blackness once the blackface was removed. For those of you unfamiliar with blackface, it actually has a long history in the United States. Starting in the mid-19th century, blackface performances became a standard form of entertainment. White actors would use theatrical makeup to represent black characters, and these performances caricatured stereotypes of black people and further cemented racist attitudes. Blackface fell out of fashion in the 1960s with the civil rights movement. It's no wonder, then, that putting on blackface is controversial in 2017. All right, so to talk about what this means for social justice in the CAM community, we've invited Mocha Puff to speak with us. Mocha Puff is an independent African-American clip producer and webcam model with a creative spirit, a huge heart, and strives to be the best businesswoman she could be for herself, her clients, and the community at large. With a passion for social justice, Mocha engages with important dialogues while elevating voices of the marginalized. So welcome, Mocha. We're really happy to have you here today. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I'm glad to be here with you. Yeah, so what is your uh, initial thoughts about what happened yesterday? So I was thinking about this a lot on the car ride home. And knowing this particular model, this isn't the first time she's done something offensive and and, and blatantly racist on my free cams. So um, that being said, I'm not surprised that it happened. You know, I mean, I think there's the obvious point of like, okay, we need we need to address the fact that somebody thinks that blackface is okay. You know right. what I mean? But on the other hand of it, especially me being a black woman and and dealing with people with either who are outwardly racist or have racist mindsets, having been around that, I just know that at the end of the day, it's you, you really can't change some people. And I feel like with that particular model, 
to be blunt, I just feel like she's she probably is racist. And I feel like that's not really the the, the, the major thing that we should be going out like, OK, oh, she, let her be racist. But she can't be racist on the site. You know, my my biggest gripe is the reaction from the website. And, you know, I'm angered by the fact that with a lot of these situations, not just on my free cams, but also on on, on various clip sites, it, it takes so much outrage from the community and so much like forward outrage from the community to get the the can the, the website administrators to respond rather than it just being a matter of recognizing right. that something plainly wrong is happening. It's clearly against the site rules. So it should be addressed immediately and just right. and, and and honestly it should just be addressed between the site and and the model like they should have just banned her from the site completely taken down her cam and you know i don't know what their what their protocol is but it shouldn't be wait until however many models right email you and are mentioning you on twitter and having having to bring all of this into the community it's already such a bad situation. Do you think that this is a good example of how the site uh, fails to deal with racism there? Most definitely. And especially with a site like My Free Cams, I mean, I, I've worked on My Free Cams for a couple of years now, and the models of color and black models are not, are not looked after at all on the site. You go to any of their chat rooms on any given day and... You stay in there long enough and someone's going to probably come in there calling them a slur, especially if you're not as well known or if you're just starting out, if you're a new person. The sites don't do anything about those members at all. They just, their response is telling the models to block the members and, and ignore it, basically, rather than remove the abusive member from the site, removing the abusive energy from the site, which is what the site should do or blocking the IP address so it doesn't come back. You know, I mean, there's there's so much more that sites could do. So I do think that this is an example of site failing to look after the models of color. Definitely. When um, a model like this does something um, like put on blackface, do you think that encourages viewers or clients to act out? Doing things like going into... Um, you know, mod- chat rooms of models of color. Exactly. And- that that's a, a, a okay thing to do or, or um, tolerated yeah, like on the said, site. I you think, think it sets it, like it, an example. It, it gives it gives them a place on the couch. It literally says, hey, racists, come here. You can take a seat right there. You are welcome. Have some tea. Have some bread. You are welcome <laughs> to eat. Enjoy right. yourself. And knowing what racism is, what it does as a system in our society, as our in our global world setting, why would you as a campsite not follow through with your zero tolerance policy on that? Like, it, it just, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, racist offenses should be, those should be one of the first thing. I'm not saying prioritize certain things over other things, but my free camps really doesn't take racist, racist offenses seriously at all, at all. Yeah. Do you think that that puts the um, people of color yeah. who work on the site uh, in At danger? At the end of the day, I mean, while we are independent cameras, we're we're broadcasting through a site. You know, the site is hosting us. So at the end of the day, the site is has some kind of responsibility in ensuring that the members and models who are on that site are upholding the site's values. So if, you, if you're allowing racist models to continue airing racist broadcasts, then, I mean, who is that saying that you really pr- protect at the end of the day? Right. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's rough because I, 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 I know that as a new, as a new model, if, if I were to see that on the site, there's no way I would ever, I would never think about joining that site. I'm lucky that I joined my free cams and I didn't see anything that crazy until I ended up killing right. myself and I had to see it in my own chat room. Do you think that, um, I mean, I think this is an interesting question yeah. in terms of how the site um, enforces and doesn't enforce rules. Do you think that if the site um, or any of the platforms were to uh, 
take mm-hmm. a stand that they could have really positive political impact. It, it it says something when when the site administrators say no, this is not okay because they're the gatekeepers. They're the ones at the end of the day that really make all the rules. Even though right. we can models, we make our own rules in our chat rooms and we control everything in there. At the end of the day, we're still under the website's head, you know, just like a boss kind of deal. So if the boss is kicking people out and you know, right. or, or doing whatever, whatever needs to be done, whatever repercussions need to be done, but it, it doesn't help anybody to wait and to let all of this fire come about and it's like I said before, there's there's just so much more that these sites could do. They're not proactive enough. And what have you had to do on your like in your chat rooms in order to um, kind of guard against that behavior? If trolls are saying something, or if someone's already said something, then I'll be like, okay, I'll block them, ban them, and then and and then just be very forward and be like, that's not going to be tolerated in my room. So if that's you, then you can get out right now. Are there like other viewers in the chat room that push back against that kind of stuff sometimes? Yeah. Usually it's, it's usually like the people who have been either like tipping or have been like kind of who have, who have, who have communicated with me in some way. So do you think there's ways that we um, either as models or as um, viewers can encourage sites to be more proactive in, uh, addressing racism and uh you know other kinds of uh, Mm. issues of social injustice that's a good question because it just it feels like we're being so loud with them already and i think that's the main thing is continuing to just be as loud as you can because you know if anything more voices definitely helps and really believe in something then speak up and speak for loud you know have you ever considered leaving my free cams over these kinds of things I've thought about it in terms of just like weighing the pros and cons, but not in terms of realistically leaving just mm-hmm. because when I was consistently camming, it was a kind of primary source of income. And when I get back to it, I expect it to be. But I, I think that's only because I haven't been on any other sites. You know, if I had another option that I knew that I could fly to right now and, and, and start getting right going right away, then I think things might be a little bit different and I might be more right. open to just jumping ship. I, I, I honestly hold the blunt opinion about my free cams that I don't think they're going to really change very much anytime soon. Like, they're just a hard-headed site. But they have a huge amount of viewers, so it's understandable why models would want to be there, yeah? They have a huge traffic and huge following, so, I mean, it's, it's a great place for new models, a great place for, I mean, you know, you can really make a home there, but they, I think... MFC is one of those sites is because it's such high traffic, it's too concerned about losing all that traffic that it's willing to kind of be more lenient, knowing that it's that it's that it's at the end of the day gonna bring in more traffic and Yeah. I mean what strikes me is that like models and the platforms themselves, like because they have such a an, or can create like such a large uh uh following and such a you know, they can create a platform for themselves, like as models, and then also like the platforms themselves that that could be such a tremendous uh, point of change (laughs) um, for for the good. And it seems like it's kind of a shame when, when people in power don't use those positions in order to, you know, fight for injustice, fight against injustice, fight against injustice. I've kind of noticed more and more just like, kind of like exposure of of webcamming as an industry and sex work in general as an industry to the kind of like quote unquote outside world and I don't know I just feel like personally in, in, invested in making sure that the industry is, is is not tainted with 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 all the racist mess well we appreciate you uh, joining us to talk about this I feel like it's an important thing to cover and to um, of course. you know yeah. speak up about uh, <laughs> well, hopefully we'll uh, have you back yeah, at some I'd point in to. the future thank you so much 
We would like to thank you all for joining us today on our first ever Peep Show podcast. We especially want to thank our guests, Christina Marusic and Mocha Puff. You can find Christina's work at ChristinaMarusic.com and on Twitter at ChristinaSaurusR. You can find Mocha's work at ProjectMiniad.com and on Twitter at XMochaPuffX. We would also like to thank Joe Kennedy for the music. The show is produced by PJ Sage. The Peep Show podcast can be found on Twitter at peep underscore cast. You can also visit our Patreon where supporters can listen to sneak peeks and extended content as well as help fund our travel to do more exciting interviews and cover interesting events. A special thanks to our first Patreon supporter and good friend, Princess Burple. I'm Jesse Sage and you can find me on Twitter at sapiotextual. I'm PJ Sage and you can find me at PJ Sage. Please join us again soon for exciting interviews with cam model Dahlia D, erotica writer Sunny Moraine, and more.